I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God is good. And all the time. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. Good morning, everyone. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. That was weak. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. All right. You know, God loves to be told, I love you. He loves that. You know, men have to be reminded, tell your wife I love you. Tell your girlfriend. Tell this person. God loves to hear that we love him. So I thank God for waking me up this morning. I really do. All over the world, and I usually say this, people go to bed at night expecting to wake up in the morning, and they don't. Every morning, in every city, in every country, people are found dead. In homes, private homes, nursing homes, hospitals, prisons, mental institutions, those who are homeless, Every morning, people are found dead who went to bed the night before expecting to get up. Now, I did not say that to ruin your breakfast. I'm simply telling that to you so that you and I can thank God every morning we open our eyes. It is not guaranteed. And so I thank God for life. I thank God I can see you. I thank God I heard that guitar being played just before I walked up. I thank God I can see those two horses in the field. I thank God I can walk on the grass. I didn't see a sign that said keep off the grass. I thank God I can see you smile. I can hear you sing. I thank God for life. If you thank him, can you say amen for God? Amen. Never take life for granted. Don't take your senses for granted. If you can see, read the Bible. Read Eloise writings. If you can hear, listen to some sermon on YouTube or audio verse or something else. Use your senses to let God know how grateful you are you have them. You look bothered, so let me leave you alone. We're coming to the end of this blessed camp meeting. It all ends tomorrow morning. Time really flies. I sometimes think of what Jesus said to Judas. That thou doest, do quickly. Because time waits for no man. If you lose money, you can get it back. You lose a spouse, you may get him or her back. You lose your job, you may get it back. You lose your health, you may get it back. You lose time. You never get it back. And so I thank God again for the tremendous privilege he's given to me to declare the words of life to you. Uh, before I uh, go any further, I was told that some of you are wondering about me as a person. So I, <laughs> I'm a very private person, but you look like nice people, so I'll tell you a few things. I am uh, from a little island in the West Indies called Barbados. It's about the size of this auditorium, very small island. But a lot of good people have come from that place. I uh, have one wife, lovely lady, very, very busy with her work, very busy. I have no children, but my wife has one child, and that is me. And uh, <laughs> I know all women can say amen to that. Every married woman has at least one child, and that is her husband. And so I... Uh, 
from a child, I've always wanted to preach from a child. I never wondered when I was in college, what should I do? I always had this calling from God. Whatever else you do in life, you must preach. I grew up as a Catholic, and at some point in my early life, my mother heard of the Sabbath, and she conducted a search for a church where people go to church on Saturday. She found it so strange. She was looking for actually a church called uh, the Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, for those of you old enough to remember him. But God in his mercy led her to the Adventist church a long time ago, before any of you were born. And uh, that's how it started for me. When I joined that church, there was a practice in the church of memorizing Bible verses. It was called Morning Watch. And you'd go to the conference every quarter and buy the book. That no longer happens, and I'm sad about that. And so the habit developed in me of memorizing. You had to learn a new verse every day, plus the memory verse for the quarterly, and then recite them at the afternoon program, which we used to call MV, which is now called AY. There was also a man in my church, an elder, who had been sick many years, and he was just in bed. In that time, all he read was the Bible. So when God raised him from his sick bed, he got up as a man with his head brimful of the Bible. When he would preach, the Bible was open on the pulpit, but he never looked down. And I was a little boy in the church, and I'd watch him. And what do you think I said? I would like to do that. <laughs> I would watch him. I couldn't understand how he would preach a sermon, 40 texts, and never look down at the Bible. And I said, I would love to do that. And so that's where my love for Bible memorization began. I believe the Lord has given me a little talent, which I try to use. Even though you have a talent, you must use it. You either use it or you lose it. And so I, uh, I love preaching the Word of God straight. I try not to water it down, no matter whom I'm speaking to, no matter what trouble it gets me into. I give God's Word straight and let the Word do its work. I love to travel and preach, and God knows that. The Bible says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And so God has allowed me to do what I like, which is go all over the place. But he said to me, go, but go and preach. And that's fine. So when people say to me, do you go on vacation? I say, every preaching appointment is a vacation because I get to see another part of the world. So I was there. Where was I? Earlier this year, I was... Uh, mm. Go so many, I was in the Philippines, and I was in uh, Wales, and I was in uh, England, and then where else was I? I was in uh, Australia in, uh, in June, uh, I was in Kenya, then uh, I left Kenya and I went to Malaysia, and I'm here, I go home on the 26th, uh, eight days later I go to Zambia for a crusade. I leave Zambia and I go to Texas for a crusade, then I leave Texas, go to Botswana for a prayer conference, then I leave Botswana, go somewhere else, then go back, then come to PNG in December, and leave PNG, go back to Botswana, and that will end the year for me. So I thank God, and I have this practice when I go to different countries. I go to a window of the place where I'm staying, or I walk outside, and I look at the country, and I thank God for the honor of being in that part of the world, even if it's a jungle. And I have stayed in the jungle before. I was in the Philippines, and I can show you the pictures if I had them on Twitter, in the place where I stayed. But I slept with the lizards making a lot of noise. At night, they call geckos. They make a loud noise for such a little lizard. And uh, ants all around the place. I bought some powder, and the ants were resistant to the powder. They absolutely refused to die. And, uh, but I thank God for that adventure. I'd wake up early in the morning, 3 o'clock, walk outside that little grass hut, and the sky was perfectly clear, see the stars. And my bathroom was a little area surrounded by a fence five feet high, so I was up above it. And, but uh, the Lord kept me private, so I thank him for that. So that's me. I love people who love God. I love people who love God's Word. I believe the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's remnant people in these last days. 
and I don't care about being politically incorrect. I just don't care. God's remnant people can be identified biblically. And one of the identifying marks is they keep the commandments of God, all ten. And so I thank God for this church and for what it has meant to me. And my prayer for you is that you will remain faithful to the truth no matter what other people do. Whether that other person is your spouse, your mother, your father, your cousin, your friend, your enemy, do not ever leave this church for any reason. Jesus said in John 6, 70, Have I not chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. Jesus had a devil among the twelve disciples, but the disciples were still the early church. Are you following me? The church does not cease to be God's church because there are devils in it. The place to find devils is in the church. Devils don't waste time going to the casino and to bars and to whole houses. The devil already has those places. The devils come to church. And so even though your pastor may be a well-dressed hypocrite, you are still in God's remnant church. Are you following me? It is still God. Don't leave and go set up a church where nobody commits any sins. You'll be wasting your time. Don't leave. Stay in God's church. And why should you stay? When a lot of disciples were leaving Christ in John 6, 66, from that time, many of his disciples walked back, uh, left him, and walked no more with him. And Jesus said to the twelve, Will ye also go away? Simon Peter answered, said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What Peter was saying, we are staying because of what you preach. Not because you have a building, because Christ had none. Not because the members drive Mercedes Benz and Lexus and BMWs. No, we are staying because of what you preach. For those of you who don't have a church, when you contemplate joining a church, don't ask, is the pastor handsome? Don't ask, where do the members work? Don't ask, is the church in the suburbs? Ask, what do they teach? And what they teach must correspond with, thus saith the Lord. If they do not teach, thus saith the Lord, you will simply be enjoying a social experience, not a worship experience. Because the foundation of worship is obedience. What did God say to Saul with Samuel as his spokesperson? Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, that's worship, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Keep your special music. Obey me. Keep your large offering. Obey me. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And let me say one other thing that may cause you a little concussion. Obedience is better than sacrifice to the extent that obedience is preferable to any sacrifice, including the sacrifice of Christ. Now you're asking me to explain that. Let me explain it. Let me pray first before I explain it. Father... This is not the message I had, but I may continue in this vein. I'll see how the Holy Ghost leads me. Now, as I explain what I said, you give me the right words, Father, that your people may not be misled. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Why did Jesus die? Give me one word. One word. Sin. If Adam had not sinned, would Christ have come to die? No. Before Adam sinned, was there obedience in the universe? Yes. In the new world when all sin is removed and sinners are no more, only the righteous and obedient, will there be obedience? Yes. And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. There was obedience before there was sacrifice. There will be obedience after sacrifice is no longer necessary. To obey is better than sacrifice. So going to church, you know what Jesus said? 
In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Mark 7, I believe, is verse 6. 6 and 7. In vain, Jesus says, this worship is useless in my eyes. Why? It is based on the commandments and doctrines of men. Now you turn that around. What is the worship God accepts? Worship based on the commandments of God. Let me say it again. You didn't get what I'm trying to say. It's my fault. Think. That's favor number three. Think. Listen again. In vain do they worship me. Why is it in vain? Why is it useless? Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Christ is saying their worship is based on man-made commandments, and so I classify it as a waste of time. You know how many churches every weekend are wasting time? Now, if that's the case, if you turn that around, you realize what Christ is saying, worship me based on my commandments, which makes obedience the cornerstone of worship. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Did you hear what I just what the Bible says? 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, why is that? Because rebellion is sin. Listen to me carefully. Jesus said, He that is not with me, come on, is against me. Which means every human being is either for God or for the devil. There are two kingdoms in this world, in the universe, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And so Jesus says, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? Matthew 12, 26. In verse 28, Jesus says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Now we have the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God. Every human being is in one kingdom or the other. Now, every human being either worships God or worships the devil. Now, you may worship the devil through your career. You may worship the devil by being obsessed with a husband or wife. You may worship the devil by being obsessed with money. You may worship the devil by whatever. But you either worship God or the devil. That's it. Now, when the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, to disobey God is to be in harmony with the devil. That's witchcraft. Not all witches look strange and live in the forest. Some of them are deaconesses. Some are health and temperance leaders. Some are whatever. Not all witches look strange. Rebellion, which is sin against God, is the same thing as working with the devil. Because every time someone disobeys God, the person obeys the devil. There is no middle ground. And so Eve, she had two words of authority. Thou shall surely die. The other word was, ye shall not surely die. She had two words, one from God, one from the devil. You and I, we face this situation every day. The word of God, the word of someone else. It may be the Pope, it may be a husband, it may be a politician, but ultimately, if it is not God's word, it is the devil's word. And God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. The devil said in Genesis 3 verse 4, Ye shall not surely die. Two words. Jesus said, You either for me or against me. You either gather with me or you scatter abroad. You either a sheep or a goat. You either lost or saved. You either wheat or tear. You go to heaven or hell. It is always either or. 
And so I say again, Jesus said, how be it in vain do they worship me? Question for you, but don't answer me. Are we worshiping God in vain? When God sent Saul in 1 Samuel 15 to destroy all the Amalekites, the Bible says, slay utterly man and beast and infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Kill everything. That was God's command to Saul as God's punishment on the Amalekites because hundreds of years earlier they had attacked the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. They are in the wilderness. And God swore, I will blot out Amalek from under heaven. But God gave them three or four hundred years to repent. And they never did. So when God told Saul, kill them, God was telling Saul to kill a people who had decided they would never ever repent. And one of the greatest favors, if not the greatest favor, God can do to an unrepentant sinner is take his life as soon as possible. Because the longer you sin, the longer you suffer in the flames of hell. God is merciful when he puts a sinner to sleep. And so God said, kill all the Amalekites. Saul went, killed all the Amalekites except one person. What was his name? Agag. What was his position? The king. And he brought Agag back. God said, Saul has turned back from obeying me. Now, God is not a statistician. God is a mathematician. You see, a statistician will say, Saul obeyed God. Let's say the population of the Amalekites was 2 million. Only one person saved. A statistician will say, oh, the whole place was destroyed. Not God. I said, not God. If God says, kill everybody, and out of 2 million, you save one, you have disobeyed. God is precise. God gave 10 commandments. If you keep nine, in a university, 90% is an excellent score. Are you with me? You get honors, nine out of ten. In God's system, nine out of ten is a failure. Because if he wanted nine, he would have given nine. He wants ten. And so at a risk of being tedious and repetitious, but repetition is an effective way to teach, the Bible says, in vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Let me tell you something. The commandments of men have absolutely no power to save. Now our theme is the power of God. Error has no power to save. But error has a negative power to destroy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says, And this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. The Bible says God's will is your sanctification and mine. Now keep this in mind. Now, listen to Jesus. He's praying to the Father. And Jesus says, Sanctify them how? Come on, tell me. Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, what Christ is saying in a prayer to his Father, only truth can sanctify. Error contaminates. Truth sanctifies. The function of truth is to remove error and to cleanse the mind. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Let me present to you the greatest expression of truth in the Bible. Go to, first, go to Psalm 119. The greatest expression of truth in the Bible. Psalm 119. Let us read verse 142. Psalm 119, verse 142. And I have no title because I was just talking to you and the Holy Spirit told me continue talking. So I have no title. 
Or you can call it the power of truth, because that's what I'm talking about. Do you have Psalm 119, verse 142? If you have my version, read it for me. What does it say? Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy... Say that again. Thy law is the truth. Now, Jesus says, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine what? The commandments are the laws of men. Now, if God's law is truth, what is man's law? Error. Thy law is truth. Go to verse 151. Verse 151. Read for me. Thou art near, O Lord, all thy commandments are truth. Now, go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. This is God speaking about the priests. And the main function of the priests was not only to take care of the sacrifices in the tabernacle, but to teach the people the word of God. That was a major function to teach the Levites as priests, teach God's word. Now, Leviticus chapter 2 verse 6, what does that say? The law of Leviticus 2 verse 6. Oh, Malachi. Ah, thank you, my lovely sister. Malachi, yes. God bless you for being attentive. Malachi. Mm -hmm. When I said the priests were, all right. Malachi 2 verse 6, what does that say? The law of truth was where? In his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. Stop. Now, I want you to look at those two. Can I come down a little closer? You didn't say yes. All right. <laughs> okay. I have to walk all the way there. I don't want to look like I'm, uh... let me just, Ooh. all right. Now, the law of truth was in his mouth. Read the next statement. Iniquity was not found where? Now, I want you to put two things together. The law of truth in his mouth. Mouth and lips are the same thing in those two. You look at those two expressions. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. So, mouth and lips, same thing. They're the same. Now, the law of truth is the opposite to what in that next statement? Iniquity. Mm -hmm. Which means, give me another word for iniquity. Sin. Then what is sin? Based on those two statements, look at what is sin? Anything that is contrary to the law of God. Look at it again. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. In other words, if the law is in your mouth, there's no room for iniquity or sin. So the law of God is the very opposite of sin. And the major function of the priest, even today, priests being the preachers, is to have his mouth full of the message of the law of God as the basis of true worship. Are you following me? Let us go to Romans chapter 2. We're looking at truth and law. Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. We read from verse 17 of Romans 2. Do you have that? Let me say a little prayer again. Father in heaven, as I proceed with this impromptu presentation which I believe your spirit has put on my mind. Let that spirit of truth be with us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we read from verse 17, keep one finger, if you can, on Romans 2, 17. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. The power of truth is our title. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Book number 5 of the Bible. The first five books were written by Moses except the last chapter of Deuteronomy, which deals with Moses' death. That was probably written by Joshua, but certainly not by Moses. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Read for me. He is the... Keep reading. His work is... A God of... A God of what? 
and without keep reading justin wright is here he is called a god of what a god of truth so god the father is truth go to john 14. john 14. you know this verse very well verse 6. john 14 verse 6. what does it say Jesus said unto him, what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God the Father is a God of truth. Jesus is the truth. Go to 1 John chapter 5, read verse 6. 1 John chapter 5, read verse 6. First John 5, all the way to the back of the Bible, a few books before Revelation. First John 5, verse 6. Do you have that? Read for me what's it say? This is he that came by water and blood, even not by water only, but by water and blood. Finish verse now. And it is the spirit that beareth. Come on, because the spirit is truth. Now, what have you discovered from those three verses? Come on. One, the Father is truth. Two, Jesus is truth. Three, the Holy Ghost is true. Now, when you worship in spirit and in truth, you are in harmony with whom? The family of heaven. Now, when you worship based on error, you are against the entire family of heaven. It makes no difference how attractive your tradition is. And the biggest tradition in Christianity is that Sunday is the Sabbath. It's the biggest, most widespread tradition, not one single Bible verse. I haven't gotten back to Romans 2.17 yet, but let me continue on what I just said. Not one single Bible. Let me show you what sin has done to our minds. Go to Genesis 2. I'll show you what sin has done to the mind. Genesis 2. I, I'm guessing it's about 12 minutes after 11. What time is it? Something like that. Okay, all right. What time do I stop? Oh, 12. Oh, okay. What book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? Two. All right, let's go to verse 16. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Finish the verse. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, who said that? Come on, quickly. God. What did God say? What do you call that? What are those things? Thou shalt surely die. What's that? Thou shalt surely die. Are what? Four? Four words. So we're looking at the words of God. Let's look at God's words earlier spoken. Go to Genesis 1. Thou shalt surely die. God's words. Let's examine God's words. Genesis 1. Let's read from verse 3. You have that? Read with me. Now, I ask you to read, but you don't read very loudly. Read with me. And God said, come on, let there be light. Stop. How many words did God speak? Let there be light. Are those God's words? Yes. Read the next statement. And there was light. Stop. What does that tell you about God's word? It's powerful. Good. Mm -hmm. Creative. Precise. It does precisely what it says. Let there be light. There was light. Not fog or haze or cloud. Light. If God's word says light, you can expect light. Now, that's God's word. Now, look at verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Of course, God made it through the word. All the way down, verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. Verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass. The word of God, the word of God. Whatever the word says is what happened. If that's clear, say amen. Now, Eve knew that. She knew that. Let's use our imagination and go to the Garden of Eden. We're looking at Eve and the serpent 
having a discussion. They're texting face to face, if I can put it like that. All right. Now you're watching Eve now. You're behind a tree. She doesn't know you're there. We're watching her. Where is Eve standing? Where do you think she's standing? What's under her feet? What's under her feet? Grass. When was the grass made? How? By the word of God. So she was standing on proof that God's word is true. Where was the serpent? In a tree. When were the trees made? Before you tell me the fourth day, let me show you. The third day. <laughs> she was looking at a tree, evidence and proof that God's word has power. What was above her head? The sun shining? Sure. Day four, verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. She saw evidence everywhere she looked. She saw proof that God's word is reliable, powerful, creative, trustworthy, and does exactly what it says. She was surrounded. Are you following me? Are you not following me? Are you following me? Okay. Now, let's get another word. Genesis 3. Let's read from verse 1. Are you there? Read with me, please. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4. Clearly now, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Stop. We will compare this with verse 17 of chapter 2. Thou shall surely die. The serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. Now, Eve was confronted with, Thou shall surely die. And what? Ye shall not surely die. She had to make a what? A choice. Between what? God's word and anybody else's word. You see, if it's not God's word, it doesn't matter who the other person is. It's the devil's word. I said that too quickly. Let me start again. If it is not thus saith the Lord, it's the devil's word, no matter who speaks it. So here's Eve, God's word, with all the proof of the power of God's word surrounding her. And the devil says, he shall not surely die. Now, question for you, what proof did she have that the devil's word had power? None. None. N-O-N-E, exclamation mark, none. Yet, without a word from God that she should do this, she made a choice based on the word of the enemy and she took that fruit. Did I make myself clear? She had no evidence at all that the devil's word had power. Yet she accepted his word. And of course, she died because God's word cannot fail. There isn't one verse in the Bible that says the first day of the week is the Sabbath. And like Eve, most of Christianity chooses a word not spoken by God. And it is so widespread, it is accepted as truth. So that those who obey the truth are regarded as funny. Let me tell you something. If error is practiced long enough, it assumes the status of truth. Mm -hmm. And when you attack that error, you are attacked. Not a verse. Now, I'm talking about the law of truth. God's will for you is sanctification. 
What is sanctification? Removing impurities from the life. How does that happen, says Jesus? Through the truth. What's the highest expression of truth? The law of God. Because the Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Pray God and keep his commandments. Come on, finish the verse. For this is the whole duty. This is all I want, says God. He wanted it before Adam sinned. He wants it now. Because God does not lower his standards. He raises a people. Ah, you missed it. You keep missing it because it's my fault. Now, in the United States, basketball is a big game. The, the basketball ring is 10 feet off the ground. Hmm? A coach doesn't lower the rim. He trains his athletes to do what? Jump high. Are you following me? The ring doesn't come down. Now, in salvation, before Adam sinned, God's ring of righteousness was 10 feet. That was for a sinless man. After Adam sinned, God left it at 10 feet. And he sent Jesus to teach us how to jump. <laughs> ah, you're not. Ah, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> he sent Jesus. Do you come, you stay with me, and I will help you reach that rim. Because God does not lower his standards. You don't lower your standards for your children when you send them to school. Because you don't want your child coming home with the worst report grade in the village. Then you have to move. Are you following me? When other people find out your child is the only child who flunked, you have to move to Adelaide. <laughs> from Honiara. So, you, God, God does not lower his standards. Yours with me. Now, we're talking about the law of truth. There's no way to practice truth outside of the law of God. You see, a law-abiding life is a truthful life. Now go to Romans 2, verse 17. Romans 2, 17. Listen carefully. And may God's Holy Spirit continue to be with us. And may God put his words in my mouth. I'll finish shortly. It's about 27 after... 11. Do you have Romans 2.17? Uh, let the men read. Men, if you have the King James Version, men always, God calls you to be the leaders in your church, in your community, in your home. So let's take the lead. Let me hear the men read. All men who are really men. Read with me if you have my version. Are you ready? Read, my brothers. What does it say? Behold, thou art called a Jew. Come on, and... Rest this in the law, come on, and make his thy boast of God. Come on, next verse. And noise his will, come on, and prove us the things that are more excellent. Come on, being instructed. Ah, let's stop right there now. Let's try to explain. Paul says, you see, in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul says, all the Gentiles need Jesus. That's what he's saying. In chapter 2, he's saying, all the Jews need Jesus. <laughs> Because sin is sin. Behold, thou art called a Jew. And restest in the law. You have confidence in God's law. And makest thy boast of God. And knowest, what? Come on. And knowest his will. The next statement says, And approvest the things that are more excellent. Finish that verse. Being instructed out of the law. Now, let me clarify. Approvest the things that are more excellent. You know how to judge between right and wrong. You know how to distinguish between genuine and false. That's what is meant by approvest the things that are more excellent. Then the verse tells us how. Because you are instructed from where? Out of the law. The law of God, remove it, and no one has a reliable sense of right and wrong. My brothers and sisters, go to Romans 7. Romans 7, let's take a look at the law. Romans 7, the power of truth is a title we came up with. You have Romans 7 verse 10. Ladies now, all ladies who love Jesus and who have my version. 
Read, ladies, are you ready, sisters? Read with me. What does it say? And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now stop. Why is Paul saying that? You see, when God gave the law, the law is a law of life. It is only death for those who disobey it. But the law existed before sin. So the law has originally always been a law of life. Disobedience brings death. Now, if you're thirsty, what do you do? You drink water. But if you inhale the water, what happens to you? You drown. Are you following me? Huh? The, if you inhale the water, you drown. The law of God is life. Mm -hmm. We can work that out very easily. God made Adam and Eve. He put them in the, the Garden of Eden. Describe that environment with a few one-word responses. The earth was perfect. The earth was pure. The earth was good. The earth was sinless. Mm -hmm. Now, here comes God. Listen to me carefully. Here comes God. Now, I am paraphrasing Genesis 2, 16, 17. Adam, my son, come. Do you like where you're living? Yes. Do you like living in a sinless world? Yes, Father. Do you like the fact there are no prisons? Yes. No hospitals? Yes. No policemen? Yes. Yes, Father. Would you like to keep it? Yes. <laughs> okay. What do I have to do to keep it? God says, simple. You see this tree? <laughs> Finish my words. Don't touch it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see all those trees, Adam? They're yours. Now, Adam, if you leave this alone, and I'll watch you for a little while, out of love, this perfect environment will continue. Life will continue. If you, give me one word, obey. Adam said, okay. And God went back to heaven. And here comes Sister Eve. I look forward to seeing Eve in the new world. <laughs> Here comes this nice vegetarian woman. And she, uh, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> she listens to the serpent and fall. Ladies, by the way, let me switch the subject quickly. When a man approaches you inappropriately, don't discuss. Leave. Don't find out, why did you talk to me like that? That's not your business. Leave. Because men have a natural ability to turn your heads. Do not discuss with a man why he's inappropriate. Just leave. And if you're a married woman, go right to your husband. Even if the man is in the church. Especially if he's in the church. Don't discuss it. If Eve had not stood and discussed, we would not be in this position. Anyway, so Eve sinned. Then Adam followed her, which brings us to another lesson. Follow me closely now because this lesson will make you angry with me. Do you like me a little bit? No, you don't. Okay, but you do? Okay, you like me a little bit, but that's all I need. Okay, <laughs> kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So I <laughs> Listen to what God said to Adam. Go to Genesis 3. I know I can smell the food, but hold on with me for a few minutes. Genesis 3. Okay, all right. Okay, my lovely sister. Genesis 3, do you have that? Listen to God speaking to Adam. And uh, Verse 17, sorry. And unto Adam he said, read now for me, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, stop. How does that first end, verse 17? Well, okay, not that far, but God said because you listen to someone else and you, you are, yes, there's a curse on the earth, the whole earth. Now, keep this in mind, there's a whole curse on the earth. Look at the first part of the verse and tell me why there's a curse on the earth. Say that again. The man did what? He put his family ahead of God. 
Now that lesson is for us in the Garden of Eden. He put his family ahead of God. So when God came down on Sinai, what's the first commandment he gave? Thou shalt have. <laughs> in many families, the baby is God. Mm -hmm. Are you coming to church? No, I can't. Why? But the baby. Are you contributing to the church building? No, 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 no. Why? Uh, the baby. Listen to me. In many families, babies are shrines where parents worship. Oh, my husband left the church. Well, I have to follow my husband. No, you don't. Not if it goes against God. Listen to me carefully. <laughs> because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. God is saying, because you listen to someone else instead of me. When you observe Sunday as a Sabbath, you're listening to someone else instead of God. When you tell people, I can have two wives. No, no, you're listening to someone else instead of God. When you say there's a place called purgatory, you're listening to someone else instead of God. And when that happens, the result is a curse. The whole earth is cursed because a man put his family ahead of God. Now, who invented the family? God. Mm -hmm. Who invented childbearing? God. Who invented food? God. But how many of us worship food instead of God? What am I saying to you? In vain do they worship me. Finish the verse. Teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Ask yourself, is my religious life based on the commandments of men? Or the commandments of God? I want you to make a decision right where you sit. Father, help me to serve you. Worship you based on thus saith the Lord, not thus saith my tribe. I give you one more Bible example, then I let you go. Go to, first, go to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. Luke 1. In this chapter, we'll read, the angel appears to Zacharias, who eventually became the father of John the Baptist. He was the husband of Elizabeth. Elizabeth could not have children. Read verse 12 of Luke 1. What does that say? Come on, nice and loud. And fear fell upon him. And the angel, come on, said unto him, what? Fear not, Zacharias, come on, for thy prayer is heard. Keep reading. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Finish it. And thou shalt call his name. Now, who said that? The angel. But the angel was told by whom to say that? God. So those were God's words. Listen to me carefully. The angel said, because the word angel is from the Greek angelos, which means a messenger. No angel has an opinion of his own. Are you following me? All unfallen angels only say what they're told to say. Not because they're robots. It's because they're obedient. So the angel told Zacharias, thou shalt call his name John. That's what God said. Go to verse 57 of Luke 1. Luke 1, 57. Read with me nice and loud and clear. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered. And she did what? She brought forth a son. Keep reading. And her neighbors and her heard how the Lord had showed. And they came to rejoice with now very carefully read verse 59 and it came to pass on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child stop now who is they yes mm -hmm. all her cousins meaning relatives and her neighbors now the two groups that exert greatest pressure on us is not the government and the church, relatives, and friends. Are you following me? Relatives and friends. That's why those who 
this study church growth, they tell you, you have best luck in bringing people to Christ if you're a friend of somebody or a relative. Now, and her, read verse 59 again, and it came to pass on the eighth day, come on, that they came to circumcise the child. Finish that verse. Now, wait a minute. What do they call him? What did John say? What did the angel say to call him? John. Now, do we have a problem? Yes. Who said Zacharias? People. Who said John? God. <laughs> who were the people who said Zacharias? All the friends, all the relatives. Now, here's an old woman. She couldn't have children for a long time. I, under I have never had a child, but I understand when a woman gives birth to a child, she's out of it for a couple of days. It's such a traumatic thing. Now, she's old. It's tough when you're young. She's old. And she's on this bed, surrounded by all the neighbors and friends exerting the pressure. Call him Zacharias. When the newborn baby is born, people come around as though they're worshiping in a manger. <laughs> they come to worship this newborn child. Zacharias. But Elizabeth knew her husband had told her, John, read verse 60. And his mother answered and said, not so. Ah, now, let me see who is really intelligent. In order for her to take that stand and say not so, what did she have to do? She had to go against, come on, talk to me, her friends and her relatives. Why did she do that? Because God said, John. Listen to me. It is not easy to go against friends and relatives. It is not, listen, <laughs> it is not easy. Your husband wants to go left. You want to go right. You'll eventually go left. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to go against friends and relatives. But this woman, eight days after giving birth, very difficult birth must have been because she was old. She said, ah, outnumbered dozens to one. She said, no, John, why? God said, John. God said the seventh day, a man-made institution said the first you must have courage to say God's word. And many people will go to hell, well-educated, well-dressed, nice-looking, for no other reason that they could not resist the influence of friends and relatives and take God's side. Sometimes you have to stand alone and say, not so. That's truth. Let me stop how many of you will say, Father, help me even if I have to stand alone to choose your word above everybody else's word? Can I see your hand? Do you mean that? Do you really mean that? Stand up with me. Now, don't go home and fight with your husband just to, or your wife. But just let people know in your life, God is first. You don't have to fight and God is first. And that never changes. You know, there's a saying, there, the, there's an exception to every rule, except the rule that says, there's this, well, mm, with this rule, there are no exceptions. God must always, finish my words, come first. Always, I said. Let heaven record, I said it, always. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your word. Sometimes it is so challenging, dear God. It hits at the very roots and foundations of the life we've built. It makes us dizzy, Father, but its, its purpose is to save us. Now, Lord, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm making a very tough appeal, but I think your spirit has led me to make it. I'll make it direct and clear, Father, and let the spirit do the work. If there's someone listening to me, you know that in your present life, you've got family or friends ahead of God by the choices you make, and you want to change that. Come. You know. By the choices you make, you're putting family and friends ahead of God. Come. You know you're doing that. You want that changed. Come. Because a curse came on the earth. Because a man put his family ahead of God. Bless all families. I have one. I'm part of one. But there are no circumstances when God must be put second. None. That always results in a curse. If there's someone you know in your heart that you're putting someone ahead of God. Come. 
You know you're doing that. But God still loves you, but he can't save you in that condition. Come. Let's say, Father, give me the courage, give me the strength, dear God. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 1.3 of Jesus Christ, when he had by himself purged our sins, the disciples ran and left him in the garden of Gethsemane when they saw the Romans. They ran. The Father forsook him for a while. That's why he said, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, if the Father forsook him, the Holy Ghost had to forsake him for a while. The angels had to forsake him. Christ was by himself, and he stayed. Why? Because he loves us, and he loved the Father. Ask God for the courage to stand alone if that is what you have to do. God needs people he can depend on. The same way we can depend on God, God wants to know I can depend on you. Anybody else? You know you've got someone ahead of God. Or something, your career, your, your education, something is ahead of God. And you want that change, come. Change it. With God's help, change it. Don't continue on this suicidal path. Change it. Let God see his first and then see how God begins to bless your life. I told you yesterday or the day before, God wants to be first because he cannot save you from any other position than position one. Here's about, come sister, come. Put God first. Put him first. You know, when God sent Christ, he put you first. Mm -hmm. and that's another subject for another time. He put you first when he sent Christ. Put him first. Put him where he belongs because he's creator of heaven and earth. You are alive because of God, not your cousin, God. Anyone else that have got something or someone ahead of God, I want that changed. I want it changed. I make a second call very quick. There's someone worshiping God based on error. You want to change that? Come. I am worshiping God based on error. And my eyes have been opened by this message. I want that changed. Come. Worshiping God based on error, you come. So, Father, it'll be difficult, but if you hold my hand, I know I'll make it. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Both. A lot of people worship in spirit, make a lot of noise, but there's no truth. There must be both because the spirit that you think you have is the spirit of truth. Anybody else? I'm worshiping God based on error. I want that change. Come. I've got something ahead of God or someone. Come. Let God enable you to switch that. You have to make the switch. God will give you the power. I give you 60 seconds and I pray. Two calls. There's someone or something ahead of God in my life and I know it. I want that to stop. Put God where he belongs. I am worshiping God based on error and tradition and custom and habit. I want that to stop. Jesus said it's a waste of time. It's better to leave God alone completely than to pretend to be his child. 40 seconds. Come. Then we pray and we go to lunch. You have life today. We don't know what will happen on your way home. I pray all of you get home safely. That's my prayer for you. But we don't know. All you know is you're alive right now. You have a chance to make a decision. 15 seconds. Two calls. Father, there's someone or something in my life ahead of you. I have to change that. Second call. Father, I'm worshiping you based on error. My eyes have been opened. Please help me to change, Father. It won't be easy, but God says with him all things are possible. We're going to pray now. Father in heaven, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for when I have put other things ahead of you, whether for five minutes or five years. Forgive me for that. I ask you to look down upon us with mercy and favor, dear God. You gave me this message. It was not what I came up to speak. You must have given me this message for a reason, Father. Someone must have needed it, even if it's one person in this congregation might have needed this message. You know I don't. If I preach badly, forgive me, Father. Now in the name of Jesus, dear God, work on the hearts of those who came. That man, that woman who has someone else in your place or something, a career, money, whatever it is, work, child, Father, give the person the courage courage from above to change the list of priorities and put you where you belong that is first if there's someone worshiping you based on error but error that has been practiced so long it looks like truth but their eyes have been opened dear god give them the guts the courage to say father put me in the path of truth 
Oh God, help us. We need help so badly. Help us, Father. We want to do what's right. We're weak. The spirit is willing, dear God, but you know how weak the flesh is. You come and help us. All we can offer you, Father, is a willingness to do what is right. Now combine that willingness with your power and produce victorious people. Bless us as individuals. Bless us as families, Father. Now bless your people. Show them how delighted you are that they have put you first. A double blessing on all the little children, Father. As we eat the food you've provided, let us think of spiritual food, which is far more important. Protect us in these final hours of this camp meeting, Father. There has been no accident, no incident. Keep it that way, dear God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. When you come, dear God, let everyone under the sound of my voice and every family member associated with the congregation have a place in your kingdom where we shall live with you forever without sin, without suffering, without death. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Sing one stanza with me. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your lunch. Be a blessing one to the other.